A narcissist is a lot like a drug addict. Just as a drug addict needs their drug to get their fix, a narcissist needs narcissistic supply to get their fix. So what is narcissistic supply to the religious narcissist, especially the covert religious narcissist? In this video, I'm going to talk about the covert religious narcissist who professes to be a Christian and how they create false doctrines to get their narcissistic supply. Now first, before we get into it, for those of you who are new to my channel, welcome. I'm Shanine Megji. I'm a coach that helps people to heal and recover their identities from narcissistic relationships. I also help people to successfully navigate difficult life transitions. Welcome to my channel on Toxicity is Not Your Destiny. I create these videos to help you navigate toxic relationships in your life from a biblical, practical, and spiritual perspective. So if you'd like to receive regular content from me on this subject, take a moment, click that subscribe button, click that bell, because I'm going to be bringing you videos on a regular basis to empower you in navigating toxic relationships. My goal is to get out a video every week or so. I was a bit late with this video because I was a bit sick last week. Um, but without further ado, let's dive into the subject. Now to start, someone that has a faulty doctrine doesn't mean that they're a narcissist. I just want to make that clear. For someone to have narcissistic personality disorder, they have to manifest at least five of these nine following traits. They have a grandiose sense of self-importance. They're preoccupied with beauty or success or power or ideal love. They believe that they are special and unique and can only associate or be understood by other special, unique, high status people. They require excessive admiration. They have a massive sense of entitlement and unreasonable expectations of people. And they want instant compliance from people. They exploit people. They lack empathy. They are envious of others, and they believe that others are envious of them. They are arrogant, prideful, and conceited. So when it comes to a religious narcissist, you are dealing with someone who is arrogant, who doesn't care about people deep down, but actually feels contempt, envy, and anger towards the people God has called them to love and serve, who can easily see people as their enemies and believe it is their job to punish them on behalf of God, a person who feels entitled to be treated like they are a king or a queen, who see God's people as their personal servants and slaves or possessions, and not as God's children sovereign over their own lives with their own unique God-given destinies. These are people who are addicted to honor and admiration and who need to have fans and yes people around them. When you have someone with these attitudes, which are actually anti-Christ and anti-God and more aligned with the devil, then they will create their own doctrines to suit their narcissism. Narcissists deceive not by necessarily heretical teachings or faulty teachings. The Bible says that the sum of thy word is truth. So that means all of God's word in its entirety is truth. But a narcissist has their pet teachings and scriptures that they put a lot more weight on. And that's the insidiousness of it all. It's the deception by omitting the whole picture and by putting disproportionate weight on some scriptures while ignoring other ones completely. Another way that a covert narcissist deceives is through a complete disconnect between what they say and how they behave and insulating themselves from any person that could call them out or challenge them on their behavior. Now, they may actually have sound teachings, but the way they live their lives and go about relationships and the work they do is completely diabolical, and they insulate themselves from anyone that can hold them accountable. Like a drug addict, a narcissist is addicted to narcissistic supply. What this means is that everything they do is for the sole purpose of getting their drug fix. So understand then that a religious narcissist is not a slave to God, but a slave to their drug addiction. Unless a narcissist comes clean before God with their addiction, their idolatry of their false self, their need for healing and salvation, unless they are sincerely seeking to follow God with all of their hearts, 
which means purifying their hearts and becoming more like Jesus Christ. If that is not their motive in being in the faith, then they are likely using the faith to feed their narcissism. Instead of feeding God's sheep out of their love and reverence for God, they are eating God's sheep to feed their addiction to narcissistic supply. So how does this play out? In two ways. Number one, through their outward, appealing, winsome, endearing image to others. And number two, through their aggression through narcissistic abuse. But of course, in a spiritual community with a covert narcissist who professes to be a follower of Jesus Christ, these things will not be overt. They will be covert, subtle, nuanced, insidious, camouflaged with all kinds of spiritual language and covering. So in this video, I'm hoping to hack into these things to bring awareness and clarity. So let's get into the ways a narcissist goes after narcissistic supply with their spiritual camouflage. So number one, a religious narcissist pursues narcissistic supply by presenting as a pious, godly person in order to get admiration and honor. So if you notice someone that has an inordinate need to showcase their godliness, how much they pray and fast, how much they're giving to other people or charities, how much ministry they're doing, how much they're serving, how much God is speaking to them, that could be a red flag that they are creating an image, this kind of image for the honor, praise, and admiration of others. They may also be looking for fans and followers and have no interest to cultivate relationships or have people close enough to them to speak truthfully into their lives. And Jesus said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Basically, what Jesus is saying here is that anything done out of the motive of getting praise and admiration from others cancels any reward or blessings that God would have otherwise given them. Narcissistic supply then becomes the cheap substitute to replace the true riches that could be had by solely seeking to please God. It's really like the sin of Esau in the Old Testament uh, that he committed where he traded in his spiritual inheritance for a bowl of soup. Number two, another way a religious covert narcissist pursues narcissistic supply is to preach about honor, talk about honor, demand it, demand submission and utter compliance from others while ignoring the parts that they are required to bring to the table to deserve the honor and compliance, such as becoming an honorable person or leading others with a servant heart. If they are a male narcissist, they may be fixated on their role of headship and their demand for respect. And they may demand to be respected and use marriage as a means to dominate a spouse because they think that being the head is about control and domination, but they fail to take in the scripture where they are called as husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and Christ died for the church sacrificially. They would fail to practice mutual submission according to Ephesians 5.21. Or a female covert narcissist may seek narcissistic supply by making herself look superior spiritually, who may call herself a prophetess like Jezebel in the Bible in order to get the admiration and respect of others and use that to control and manipulate people. If you are around someone like this, you may be dealing with a religious narcissist who is after narcissistic supply more than they are after following Jesus Christ. Now, if a covert religious narcissist is not getting his or her supply through the positive means, which is by presenting themselves in a winsome, endearing way that wins people's favor and admiration, then they will get it through aggressive means, through narcissistic abuse. And this usually happens with the people closest to them. And that is because those people have been around them enough to see through their mask. And frankly, they are turned off by the traits of the narcissist. So since the narcissist cannot succeed in getting admiration and honor from these people close to them, they will get their sense of significance through their aggression against them. And they will weaponize scripture and put a spiritual cloak with spiritual language on their aggression which plays out through narcissistic abuse in order to justify it. So here are some ways a covert religious narcissist will spiritualize their aggression to get narcissistic supply from you. Number one, 
they will use examples of God's control and punishment of people, mostly from the Old Testament, to justify their use of control and punishment or demands of people. They are most likely to teach about Moses on the mountaintop getting the revelation from God, and everybody else has to submit. And if they don't submit, the earth is going to open up and swallow them alive or something along those lines. I mean, lawlessness was qu punished quite severely in the Old Testament. Uh, there are a lot of stories about it, stories uh, about people like Korah and the men who rebelled with him, where the earth swallowed them up, or Absalom, who rebelled against his father, King David, or Noah's son, who saw him naked and was cursed. So there's quite a few stories where there were massive curses that came upon people who were lawless or disobedient. So a narcissist is more likely to go and harp on those scriptures and those stories and use them to justify punishing and controlling people to operate with a callous heart towards people. But the problem is they omit to mention that the first attribute that God uses to describe himself when he reveals himself to Moses is compassionate, abounding in love, and slow to anger. If the narcissist is going to talk about an Old Testament God, then they need to cover the full picture. The Old Testament God describes himself as first and foremost as compassionate, gracious, loving, slow to anger God. And if a narcissist is going to refer to Moses on the mountaintop, then they also have to account for the fact that God gave his authority to a man who was incredibly humble, who never took any challenges, criticisms, or complaints personally, but brought them before our God each time with his face down to the ground. If a religious narcissist wants to use examples of the Old Testament to refer to themselves as someone who carries the authority of God, they should also talk about the incredible humility that is required of them to carry such an authority. Just as Moses, who got on his face before God, whenever complaints and challenges were brought before him. The Bible actually says about Moses, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Number two, a second way that a religious covert narcissist pursues narcissistic supply aggressively is to focus on rules, performance, and obedience over love. Yet Jesus says we will be known for our love. A religious narcissist omits to talk about the main thing, which is love. They don't know what to do with terms like love and compassion because it is not part of their vocabulary or modus operandi. So they will create their own false religion that omits those attributes that are a main part of who God is. Their demand for perfection in performance is actually a sin of their own idolatry of human beings, believe it or not. A narcissist commits the sin of idolatry when they demand perfection of people because they're basically demanding people to be a perfect version of God rather than extend the grace for them to be human beings, which God created them to be. Number three, a third way that a religious narcissist aggressively pursues narcissistic supply is to replace God in your life instead of representing God. So they are forcing you to idolize them and to put your relationship with them above your relationship with God. And that is idolatry. And that gives them an excuse to oppress you, to silence you, and become tyrannical with you in a way like Pharaoh oppressed the Israelites and became tyrannical and abusive with them and kept them in bondage. A fourth way that a religious narcissist pursues narcissistic supply aggressively is to have double standards, a set of standards for you and a set of standards for them. They will expect that you are required by God to forgive them 70 times 7 times and will be preoccupied with your need to forgive them, but they will give no thought to their need to repent, to confess their sins, to humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways in order to be healed. They pay no attention to their part in it. Or they may be up in arms if you cross them, if you slight them in any way. There will be hell to pay if you cross a narcissist. But if you are hurt or offended with them, well, they pay absolutely no attention to the scripture that says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, First go and be reconciled to them and then come offer your gift. 
So God is not fooled by these wolves in sheep's clothing. He actually addresses such people in the Old Testament and the New. And there is a passage of scripture that addresses this kind of spiritual abuse really well in Ezekiel 34. I'll share it with you in the voice translation just to give it a bit of a fresh sound. And so these are the people God calls false shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel whose only concern is to protect and nourish themselves. Isn't a shepherd's job to look after the sheep? Yet you exploit them in every way. You devour their fat, make soft clothes and blankets out of their wool, and slaughter the best sheep for your table. Meanwhile, you don't take care of the sheep at all. You have not sought to nurse the weak. You have not gone out to tend to the sick. You have not bandaged the injured. You don't bring back the strays or look for the lost. You have led them with neglect, ruled them with harshness, shepherded them with cruelty. They had no real shepherd, so they have scattered. The entire flock was prey for wild beasts. My sheep drifted aimlessly through all the mountains and up and down every hill. My flock was scattered all over the world, scattered like stars in the night sky, and not a single shepherd went looking for them. God condemns the shepherd rulers of Israel for neglecting their duties and exploiting their human flock. Heaven will not remain silent at this injustice. A change is coming. Now pay attention, shepherds, to my word. As surely as I, the eternal Lord, live, because my sheep are without a shepherd, because they have become prey for all the wild beasts to feed upon, because my shepherds have not gone in search of my sheep, but have only looked out for themselves and not watched after and cared for my flock, I encourage you, shepherds, listen to the word of the eternal. Those self-centered shepherds are my enemies. As far as I'm concerned, they are no longer shepherds. They will not help themselves to my sheep any longer. I will recover my flock from these corrupt shepherds. I will snatch my sheep from their mouths. My sheep will no longer provide milk, clothing, or meat to them. I will personally go out searching for my sheep. I will find them wherever they are and I will look after them. In the same way one shepherd seeks after, cares for, and watches over his scattered flock, so will I be the guardian of my sheep. I will be their rescuer. No matter where they have scattered, I will go to find them. I will bring them back from the places where they are scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will call them out from the nations, gather them from the countries, and bring them into their own land. I will feed them in the high mountain pastures and meadows of Israel. I will feed them on good pastures. They will graze on the mountain heights of Israel. They will lie down to rest on this good ground. And they will feed on succulent grasses and bountiful pastures on the slopes of Israel's sanctuary mountains. I myself will watch over my sheep and feed my flock. Whenever they are tired, I will lead them to rest on the cool mountain grass. When they are lost, I will seek them and bring back every last stray. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. However, I will destroy the fat and powerful. I will feed them a healthy portion of judgment. By narcissists professing to be Christians and twisting and omitting scriptures to create doctrines to feed their narcissism and divorcing their actions from their words and creating double standards for themselves and others, they're actually creating a new religion. It is their cult religion and not Christianity. It is an insidious way to intercept your relationship with Jesus Christ and force you to worship them instead and elevate your relationship with them over your relationship with God. So if you are part of a church or spiritual community, be like a good Berean and search out the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. Check and see what religion you are following, whether you are following the doctrines of Jesus Christ or if you are being taken off track to follow the doctrines of demons. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Jesus said about the narcissists of his day, Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. So I hope this video gave you some insights to help you discern a religious covert narcissist and the tactics they use to pursue their drug of narcissistic supply while covering up with all of this spiritual camouflage. If you're thinking of leaving or have left a toxic environment and you're in a season of transition, check out a free training I have put together. It is all about three key ways to navigate a difficult transition. These are things that brought a massive breakthrough in my life when I was going through a difficult transition. I have included a link in the description box below. 
If you'd like to see more content from me and have not subscribed yet, click that subscribe button and click that bell so that you can get the alerts because every week I will be posting a new video to empower you in navigating toxic relationships. If you have suggestions of topics you would like me to cover in the future, please feel free to drop your ideas in the comment section. I really appreciate it. And this brings me to the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.